Well, according to the tables which we have assembled, it is our estimate that 4% of the American people own 85% of the wealth of America, and that over 70% of the people of America don't own enough to pay the debts that they owe. How many men ever went to a barbecue and would let one man take off the table what they intended for nine-tenths of the people to eat? The only way you'll ever be able to feed the balance of the people is to make that man come back and bring back some of that grub he ain't got no business with. Hello and welcome to Chaos Effect History. I'm McLean and with me as always, good old Tyler. <laughs> How's it going? How you doing, Tyler? I'm doing good. Uh, yep. I just want to start this off by saying uh, on last week's episode, we fucking called it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe we should stop. I'm afraid we're going to start. This might be a habit of us willing things into existence. I mean, if we will another Huey Long into existence, will that be that bad? <laughs> Let's, I don't know. Let's figure it out. Today's episode, we talk about Huey Long. Huey Long is known as many things. The Kingfish, Long Live the King, and the Dictator of Louis, Louisiana, who ruled like a tyrant. History has been divided amongst him. He's either the man who broke down social barriers and made progress and helped bring a southern backward state of Louisiana into the modern society it would become, or he's the chaotic tyrant who put bureaucracy in place in order to have absolute power. Yep. <laughs> what a guy. What I a like saw the Star Wars quote of absolute power in your face when I said that. I am the Senate. <laughs> <laughs> he really was, though. Especially when he ran for Senate. <laughs> yeah. Um, so what do you know about Huey Long, the Kingfish? Uh, well, I know quite a bit about him, actually. He's, as, there was, there was one YouTube video, uh, I watched a couple years ago, Mm. and I can't remember the name of it. If it comes up, I'll, uh, I believe I know who you're talking about, like, that dude who talks about, like, how, We'll get into this, but Huey Long has this incredibly complex, interesting history, but a lot of aspects kind of get summed up to be like the dictator of Louisiana becomes a meme. Yeah. So it, as, as typical with me, as soon as something like historical, like I find out about it, I'm like, oh, I got to go down this rabbit hole. So I watched a YouTube video about him and I was like, what the, how did I not know this guy existed? That's crazy that this actually happened. So I did I went super deep into uh, research and uh, my memory has not failed me that bad. So, <laughs> yep. so let's start with the childhood of the Kingfish. Huey Long was born in 1893 on August 30th. Huey Pierce Long was, well, he came into a well-off life. His mother, Catalian Tyson, was a very smart woman. So was his father, Huey Pierce Long, a livestock farmer. They were considered a frontier family because even though it was the 1893, about the pretty much as far into the Industrial Revolution as you could get, a lot of America still wasn't completely developed quite yet. Even though more states had been established at this point, keep in mind, America was still a growing nation. Most of Huey's neighbors were in poverty, even though he wasn't. And he was kind of in a household that was kind of a higher echelon compared to its neighbors. Huey was a, had a spirited nature that could be found at a young age. He would often get in trouble chasing farm animals. His father had to build a cover over the well, fearing that young Huey might just get a little too interested one day and jump in and see what would happen. Huey, small for his age, didn't share many interests with the boys around him. Instead, he took to books, becoming a bit of a aficionado and find works. But the problem was he had trouble getting his hands on books because, well, he lived in Louisiana in the, in the late 1800s and early 1900s. Yeah, um, we've established Huey as a well-off figure, but well-off to those standards is still very low. Yeah, well, I, I should probably clarify. Well-off <laughs> means like... 
he was literate. They could afford to put food on their table every night, and they might have had like some nicer clothes. This is what we'd probably consider like middle class now, or upper middle class even. Yeah. Uh, well, well off has a very different meaning in a uh, 1890s Louisiana. Yeah. He, they were, it seems like being livestock farmers caused them to come in a bit of wealth compared to their neighbors. Yeah, for sure. Yep. Um, but because if, if, if that's considered well off, you can only imagine the poverty that was happening amongst uh, the other people around him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well off is one of those, like when we think well off now, it means ah, so he has a boat and a jet. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, that poverty has a huge impact on a young Huey. He also wasn't very fond of farm work. Something I wish I say I could relate to, but I'm pretty far- fond of it myself. Well, he I've didn't heard. like the repetition and boringness that came with it. He instead took the jobs like delivering baked goods. Very and baking, weirdly enough, would help him out more than once in life. So in his childhood the shimmering glimpses of his political beliefs would grow. So I want to make a brief statement about many figures like Huey Long. Huey Long is a character whose history might be a little hard to get quite right because a lot of the information about him either came by people who hated him or people who loved him. So I did my best to try to cross-check resources, and this is the product of it. However, if you preferred, if you don't believe believe us, you can look up. There are several websites dedicated to Huey Long and several government documents that document the life of Huey Long pretty well. But let's start going into uh, the early glimpses into what could possibly inspire Huey Long to become the king of Louisiana. Uh, so Huey claimed that when he was eight, a farm, a nearby, a neighbor farmer had gone. A neighborhood farm had gone up for auction in order for the farmer to pay his debts to the store. During the auction at the steps of the course, the farmer begged the crowd, pleading with them uh, that he would pay his debt if they gave if they gave him enough time to harvest his crop. When the sheriff was about to declare there would be no sale that day, the credit union made a bid on the farm and won, forcing the farmer and his family into poverty and homelessness. To quote Huey Long, that poor farmer was, the poor farmer was, I, I was, <clears throat> the farmer was poor. I was horrified. I could not understand. It seemed criminal. This was stated uh, during one of his election, uh, him reflecting later on in this. So yeah, and here we discover, wow, this really is America. <laughs> so let's talk about where Huey Long was from, Winfield. So Winfield was a stronghold of populism. What do you know about populism? Well, the populism movement was very uh, popular at that time. You have a lot of uh, really prominent figures uh, popping up. Uh, throughout the late 1890s and early 1900s and 1910s. Right. Um, Charles Copeland, who is a famous, uh, known as the radio chaplain, which we might do an episode on, was also considered a populist. Yes. So a little more in-depth on populism. So populism is the philosophy that the needs of the common people overwhelm the needs of the elite and corporations. Now, some might correlate this to socialism, but we shall be clear. Huey Long was a staunch anti-socialist. We'll talk about why that might be a little later, but that is something I want you to keep in mind when we talk about this throughout this uh, story of one Huey Pierce Long. Huey came from from intelligent parents. As I said earlier, they would... He was very spirited. He was allowed to speak, speak free-mindedly, and he'd often go up to strangers playing checkers and to explain to them what they should do next. 
His mother was remembered as being a tolerant and compassionate woman, often make her children go to the neighbors who were less fortunate with gifts of food and clothing. She made sure her children had the righteous gift of charity. Huey also inherited a photographic memory from her. So uh, I think you like you, you kind of know where the Huey Long story goes, but you starting to make like put together puzzle pieces about how he turned out the way he did. Yes, for sure. He's he's uh, he's already has the scheming mind, or uh, that develops pretty young, uh, and the memory, and that kind that kind of attitude that he has, um, where he's, he he you, you you can see where he's like. I'm I'm t- I'm too smart for these people. <laughs> He's also like two steps away from becoming a Batman type character too. <laughs> Just <laughs> yeah. like he needs two dead parents, and then he's like a yield Batman. Dude, may- maybe instead of a dictator, he could have become the first superhero. All <laughs> <laughs> uh, timelines. Just for Louisiana, so it'd be like the Wom Batman or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, so he would also be known as a brilliant man. In fact, in high school. He, the 12th grade had just been added, which is a weird thing to say. I know. So to re- graduate, you had to get your 12th grade now. Now, Huey Long started passing a petition around for, to get make it that he can circumvent the 12th grade and graduate anyway. The school kicked him out for doing this. Oh, no. Whoever thought. <laughs> <laughs> it, I love the idea, too. It's like, you don't want to learn an extra year? We'll teach you. We're kicking you out of school. <laughs> no, right. <laughs> Despite this, Huey Long would go through much of his life without ever getting a single degree in anything, and would pass the bar exam at twenty-one. Man, who needs school anyway? He was later awarded a high school diploma, but this was more or less done after he had become governor of the state. I, <laughs> you know. At the meager age of 17, Huey Long became a traveling salesman. He had a natural ability to connect to people, which he claimed would help him become an attorney later on and beyond that, a politician. Despite being a natural-born salesman, he didn't want this to be his permanent lifestyle because at the time, salesmen were... Uh, kind of going out of style and often where one bad break, uh, one bad streak could make you lose everything. And you didn't want to see this happen. He saw it happen with many other salesmen going from well-employed to broke and poor because their company fails, you fail, or something else goes wrong. But you have to think in this time, things like stores were becoming more common or magazines and the ability to do things like call or mail in to order things from catalogs were taking the jobs of a lot of uh, salesmen. So it kind of makes sense. Now we'll talk about how baking once again came into his life. While while at a bakery, a baking contest, Huey Long uh, met one Rose McConnell. Rose McConnell uh, was participating in this uh, baking contest that Huey actually started himself to advertise his large substitute called Cotillin. Large substitute. Oh, yummy. <laughs> he won over Rose uh, McC- McConnell uh, at the baking contest, awarding the two prizes to Rose and her mother. I'm sure he did. He did that. Awarded those just justly. Rose and Huey would marry later and have three children. A daughter also named Rose and Russell and Palmer Long, which are the two best names I could think of. Russell and Palmer Long. Wow. <laughs> uh, also, law att- Long attended three semesters of law classes and, uh, at the Oklahoma and Toll Lane University. So... This is where that is the total of his like education beyond the high school that he kind of finished. Um, now, Huey Long would begin his first office as a practicing man of law. Because keep in mind, he basically walked up to the exam, uh, you know, the exam board said, Hey, you gonna let me take this? They said yes. And he got his bar exam, which I'm sure at that time is like, 
Do you know how laws work? Kinda. You're a lawyer. Good job. It's 1915. <clears throat> so he opened his store, his uh, law practice office above his uh, own uncle's uh, bank. Uh, his first desk was a or was a dry goods box, and uh, his wife knitted a cloth to cover it so it didn't look like a dry goods box. Now, Huey, with his personal beliefs, would, would never take any case against the poor man. He never would go against the little man. Again, uh, he gained, eventually gained notoriety for taking the, uh, the side of a widow against the bank, the bank owned by his uncle. He would later state, tell uncle, tell uncle Gar, his uncle's name was Gar, by the way, they should feel... Uh, they should feel compliment that Huey Long don't take out the top water, but all the big fish. Which I try, I've been spending my entire day trying to figure out what that means. And I think it means you guess you should feel good. I don't just go after anybody. I just go for the big guys. Yeah, I guess I guess that's him like signifying like you know what you're you're big enough to be worth my time. Which is yeah. both a compliment. And it has an enemy. He won that case against his own uncle. Yeah. But like that's <laughs> it's 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 both complimentary and arrogant at the same time, and it's kinda it's kind of based. <laughs> Good job, Huey. You got him. He would later move again. Uh he would all at this point in life, he was representing smaller businesses, including worker compensations. Um. Uh, this is around the time he would begin a lifelong battle with the Standard Oil Company. Good old Standard Oil. He began this when he represented a smaller company in a dispute against Standard Oil. This was like the time of great names. You didn't have to have like stupid names like Space uh, Space X. Actually, kind of makes sense. Like Space. I'm trying to think Amazon or stuff like that. You were just named the shipping company or. Standard shipping or dude, standard oil. Like wh- what I wh- I remember when I was learning uh, about this this time period for the first time, and I was hearing about like the greatness of people like John D. Rockefeller and how he became the richest man to ever live, and the, and then hearing like, oh, what was his company called? Standard Oil. It's like, excuse me. Yeah. <laughs> when you learn about the captains in this industry or robber barons or whatever you want to call them. And schools were taught these were great geniuses. How they get so wealthy? Let's not talk about that. <laughs> it was it was it was more so like, yeah, these guys. We're we're taught that like the robber barons are bad people, but they're also like good American dream racks to riches stories too. Yeah, like, I was not taught that. Rich. I was taught pretty pro robber barons. Yeah, it was it was it was a mix of like, hey, these guys are not good uh these these reforms that happened in during the gilded age did a good job at putting these dudes in their place but isn't it cool how you can go from nothing to be the richest man ever (laughs) right so now let's get into the beginning of the political uh political career of huey long so he entered his political career by getting involved with a very powerful organization in Louisiana, the Railroad Commission. What yeah. A, what, what a name. <laughs> <laughs> the Railroad Commission. People were really creative. Uh, he won a seat at 25. No political backings or no, uh, fu- no business fundings, which is actually a pretty big feat for the time. Um, he stayed loyal to his idea of being represented the people who attack co- corporate monopolies, going door, pretty much going like door to door, like canvassing entire districts by himself to try to figure out what the people wanted. Um, and he would like go to you know his districts and every town and crossroad and give speeches. And keep in mind, he's just on the commission board for the railroad company. He's not even like running for mayor or anything at this point. However. Um, sticking true to his populist nature, he would become the chairman of the public service uh, communion, uh, which is also the same 
organization that the railroad commission was. I didn't mean to say community commission. So yeah, that it kind of grew into a bigger thing as the state became bigger. Um, he eventually uh, sued the Cumberland Telephone Company for raising their rates and argued to, for an appeal again on the Supreme Court. The phone company was forced to send back 80,000 checks to their overcharged customers. That's a lot. <laughs> what a win. Yeah. During this trial, he impressed the Chief Justice, Howard Taft, who claimed that Huey Long was one of the best legal minds to ever go before the Supreme Court. Hmm, that Taft guy sounds familiar. I wonder what else he did. Nothing. Let's move on. <laughs> um, <laughs> Huey Long is like kind of like the for us, like a Forrest Gump from Louisiana. Wait, where's Forrest Gump from? It's from Bam, I think. Yes, I think so. I haven't seen that movie in years. He's like a very he's like the opposite of Forrest Gump, where he goes around and pisses people off when he meets them. Though, <laughs> we'll talk about that a little later. So, um, he would then eventually uh, <laughs> made his first statewide bid when he ran for governor at the age of thirty. He mocked the old governor uh, and the regulars of New Orleans. Uh, the old regular uh, party calling them pawns and they had big business ran them. Basically a lot of things that you hear now that big business is the enemy and stuff like that. Huey also stood against the Ku Klux Klan, refusing to take any influence from them. And he never really ever played the race card, which I know. And so let's talk about playing the race card in this period of time. That didn't mean he was like, not pandering to like minority voters and more or less meant he wasn't siding with whites and saying he was going to do a bunch of terrible Jim Crow things. Right. Because if you wanted to win an election, that was one way at that time you could do that, which is terrible. Yeah. It's, (laughs) it's weird that like being not associated with the clan for that time is considered like, so in in the especially like in louisiana and other places in the south like that (laughs) radical is considered progressive we should also just like when we say just the south we do should remember our northern college is built very close to where the headquarters of the ku klux klan used to be oh yes which is terrifying yeah but um the, the south at that time especially um coming up soon in the in the 1920s but in the post reconstruction years yeah uh, we're, we're going to do some episodes on how much influence the Ku Klux Klan had um and when you think of the Ku Klux Klan now you think of some rednecks with bags over their heads just doing some racisms they were like a full ass society at this time so it wasn't like just pissing off a handful of rednecks. It was pissing off some people who were very entwined within society at this time. Right. And it wasn't just, they weren't just like owning the libs. They were literally like murdering people. <laughs> yeah. Blowing up church and stuff like that. Um, they still do that. They're still terrorists. They're still bad people and have killed people today to this day. Yes. Um, so he placed his focus on economic equality. Uh, he ran a close race and missed the runoff by seven th- by 7,400 votes. He came in third. Who said if it wasn't for the heavy rain, he would have gotten that one because all of his prime, uh, primary voters are from rural areas. He would later make the Louisiana Dirt Roads an issue, uh, saying that that was what prevented him from taking the win that day. Right, like... The rain sounds like a BS excuse now, but when all of your roads are made of dirt and then it rains and then there's just mud everywhere, it is hard to get around. When all your roads, and let's keep in mind, not everybody had cars yet. Yeah. Like, and if something you did have cars, there's a strong chance the wheels were made of wood still. So, like, it's to to get to a, a polling center is not easy. And to make and making that is worse. You add, you add rain on top of that. No, nobody's gonna go. Uh, I mean, people went and voted, but like it's 
it's it's so much more difficult to do that. So the rain, the rain to us would sound like, all right, he's just making stuff up. But like, no, that's like a legitimate reason why people couldn't vote. Yeah, it's kind of like if the biggest blizzard or hurricane or whatever happened on election day. Right. Um, that's how severe rain thing. And, and we'll talk about like Huey Long fixing this in the long run. 1928, he ran again. Um, for Louisiana, again, for Louisiana governor, uh, he would kick off his campaign with the slogan, Every Man a King. One that Huey took from his populist hero, William Jennings uh, Byron. Brian. <laughs> Brian. Sorry. Brian. Anyway. Um, another like again another character we we might end up doing an episode on just given the similarities here uh his campaign was driven on the idea of toppling corruption and once again his idea of economic equality louisiana still under the old regulars at this time so let's keep that in mind uh and was Talk about Louisiana itself at this time. Now, you might think, well, it's getting closer. It's the roaring 20s. We're depressions a few years away. It's a pretty good time to be alive, right? One in, f- one in four people. Mm. If you lived in Louisiana, only one in four people were literate. Oh? Yeah. <laughs> the illiteracy rate was incredibly high. Most people didn't finish school and education wasn't a common thing. And the taxes were designed to, in, hin, to hinder the lower class, but serving the upper classes. So Long made hundreds of campaign speech, um, speeches among rural voters. He knew that he needed the rural voters and this idea of equality to all for this win. Uh, he would focus on the needs of the people. He promised roads, free health care, education for all, and to lower tax taxes. Long would win by a record-breaking margin, and to this day is one of the largest votes in history, like for a governor of Louisiana. However, the state would become split between two groups, the pro-longs and the anti-longs. The day he took office, more than 15,000 people had flocked to see him to take office. And this would begin the kingship of Huey Long. So uh, what do you think so far about our boy what, Huey? What an origin story. <laughs> it's Yeah. Started from the upper middle clashes, now we're here. This This is the... This is probably like one of the most like American upbringings I can think of. Like this very much encapsulates the American experience at yeah. the time. And so, what do you think day. of his first two campaigns too? Um, I, I, it's it's hard for me to like um like knowing what happens later and then no just imagining him at at this early stage. I'm like, this guy seems pretty cool. I could never, but like I would never imagine him getting very far with this because of how not only anti-corporations he was, which is a big no-no because the corporations run literally everything. And also um, given like his, like relative, like he starts off in the railroad commissions to imagine that kind of stuff, like growing to the, to the governorship and then eventually the Senate, it's kind of wild. He didn't and have a high school diploma. Exactly. Like how far he went with what little he had is insane. And had his uh, a spoiler alert, had his life not been cut short, he probably might he might have actually uh if the things president. that later on happened in this episode didn't happen, he might have been president of the United States. Correct. <laughs> like I if, if like I would have no doubts that that would happen yeah i think the thing that happens is the only thing that stopped him from becoming president of the united states so huey turned his state into a bureaucracy making sure they had evil equal people at every level of government he wanted loyalist supporters 
and a loyal political system that would pretty much do whatever he said. Um, but also with this came a chance. If you came up, it, it was a very common thing that if you needed a job and you came to him, he'd find you one or provide you a scholarship or a small loan to help you get there. So, yeah, at one hand, he is giving friends and people asked nicely and people have voted for him a jo- jobs for him. On the other hand, he's doing some very guys things like giving scholarships for, to people who wouldn't have opportunity otherwise. So Huey would push bills through. Uh, well, this includes some um, uh, free books for children of all schools, and this was regardless of race. Um, keep in mind something. He never really discriminates in anything he does. He, while not necessarily progressive, he definitely didn't care about race like in others would. He didn't see segregation as something that was essentially a focus for him. He... His view, he was more against economic equality than racial equality, but he was also not one for racism. He was against the Klan and he was against a lot of the old establishments that existed at the time. Right. But he would also do things like abuse police power and, as we've said, install his own people wherever. Uh, However, around this time, he would also begin meeting tons of opposition because most of the newspapers were backed by anti-longs. They'd start calling him a dictator, and uh, he would run a tight ship. He had the third lowest cost government of the nation at the time. So within all the state governments, he had the third lowest cost one. So he was saving a ton of money. He also prompted, so he was a big fan of Louisiana State University. Um, You could find him at many football games on the weekends, or you could find him in the locker room giving uh, prep speeches to all the uh, pep talks to all the uh, young men about to play football. He even came up with their fight song, which is used to this day. Oh, really? I did not know that one. (laughs) Yep. Uh, he also reworked the tax program completely, making big businesses pay more money and also taxing the rich and the rich and powerful even more while cutting taxes for the poor people. Crazy idea, right? What Tax, taxing the rich? No, we, can, we cannot have that. That's that's too that's too radical. So, companies such as Standard Oil would seek that he was kicked out because how dare he make us pay as much as poor people. I hate the past. I hate this so much. <laughs> this, the, the past gets even sadder when it's the present. <laughs> <laughs> um, so basically what happens here is they take him to the Senate around the same time he was also playing a Senate and they say they'd impeach him um, and people start blocking his uh, him. And when he says he's impeached, he says, well, now I'm going to run for Senator. Um, he- later on, nothing really happened besides the impeachment kind of getting halted. He, even though he almost successfully got one third of the Senate to throw this out as illegal. Um, they didn't really know who he was too. He wasn't like a well-known name quite yet besides being known as the governor. Um. So he kind of just walked up and said one third of them, regardless of party politics, like, hey, I think you should throw this out. But he couldn't get the two thirds needed. Um, So with the impeachment of Huey Long halted, uh, his approaches began to shift shift in how he came across politics. I used to try to get things done by saying, please. Now I dynamite dynamite them out of my path. This is the nuts on this lad. <laughs> yeah, he's uh this is his response. This is kind of um you know, I tried to think of somebody who spoke like him, but I don't think there's any modern equivalent of somebody who gives speeches like him. Yeah. He's Huey's uh, one of a kind. Yeah. Huey Long would run for Senate in 1930. Also, it's only 1930 by this time. Um, he would 
Uh, he would run as Huey Long for Senate and Good Roads. Ro- he really liked Roads. That was his big thing, Roads. I mean, we take we really take Roads for granted now. We really do. Keep in mind, that was also pretty much Eisenhower's thing. Eisenhower yeah. made a really good road. That's one of his it, things he did. His um, interstate highway system was... It also, like, destroyed public transportation. But, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's controversial for sure. But yep. no matter uh, his his highway system changes the the landscape of America and m- makes uh, cross tra- country travel or cross straight state travel travel and is so much more accessible. But we're talking about long Eisenhower is a different person for a different time. Yeah. <laughs> so um, Huey Long would run under the share our wealth movement, which is the idea of every American pays their fair share. What? Is he a communist? <laughs> he would kill you if he he'd punch you in the face. I, I'm leaving a lot of this out, but there are multiple times <laughs> while running for senator, he would punch people in the face for insulting him. Yeah. <laughs> um, I didn't go into that to save time and I didn't think they were significant enough, but yeah, he'd get in physical fights with people. Um Bruiser for sure. Mm-hmm. So hit the hit now. Their Democratic Party wasn't a fan of him running with this movement because he was taking attention from one Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who happened to be running for a little position called the President of the United States. Oh, yeah, I know that guy. He promised that if he'd win, he would resign. If he didn't win, he would resign as governor, which he would have to do either way. If right. He won. I, I don't get why he said that, but. I mean, he wouldn't have to, if he lost, he wouldn't have to, but if he wins, he still definitely has to. Yeah. Like that's, that's kind of, that's kind of the job. Although he kind of didn't. And I'll get into that. Right. So long, de- long defeated the opposed to Senate, Joseph ran, uh, Ransdale. Uh, but he left the Senate empty for nine months. Cause Huey did not trust his Lieutenant governor at the time. Uh, fearing, fearing that he'd roll back his reforms. Um, when Huey finally did left for Washington uh, after nine months, once he installed a uh, his old friend and ally, Alvin O. King. <clears throat> uh, sorry. Yeah. Or, yeah, his old friend, Alan O. King. Um, Huey would insult uh, the former uh, senator by basically saying to the criticism of him not being there for nine months that the seat was em- that that's nothing compared to the seat being empty for 32 years of Randall's Senate. Oh, uh, Huey still never let go control of Louisiana in the next gubernatorial election. Uh, he made Oscar K. Allen, his childhood friend became the replacement. Allen would ask Allen would basically follow any order. Um, so he kind of still controlled the government of Louisiana, even though he was the senator. Because his best childhood friend and staunch loyalist supporter was in charge now as governor. Yeah. Um, in the Great Depression, Long pushed again uh, for the few powerful men, uh, pushed again and would one note once note that... Uh, that 95% of the wealthy uh, of the wealth in the country was held by only 50% of the nation. Um, he would push against wealthy families and, you know, that goes well for you. Uh, and he also wanted to uh, he, Congress to call this out too. Basically it's like, come on, Congress, call this out, do something about it. 1934, he pissed, he pushed for the share our wealth reform and he wanted to make, it that no one can make more than $50 million and later lower it to five to $8 million. Whoa. Yeah. This, imagine, so, imagine somebody having the guts to pull something like that. Now this is an idea of wealth capping and it's been passed in the past. And it's a weird thing where I really do agree with him. Like I didn't think hey, we should make four or five and eight million dollars, but yeah, maybe fifty million dollars seems reasonable if you're making more than that. Maybe you can afford to give the rest of it up. Right. 
I couldn't imagine needing more than fifty million dollars in my life. No, you you don't. <laughs> Um, he also Meanwhile, aimed to provide equal opportunity for all Americans and wanted a standard opportunity in living. So, yeah, he basically wanted people to have things like homes and food and jobs. Oh, my God. What a what a radical. Imagine giving people like textbooks and being able to read and paving their roads. That's ugh. So Huey, in his in his classic fashion of making friends everywhere he goes, would refer to both parties as sellouts to big business. You know, <laughs> changed. <laughs> um, and he would be called many things for saying things like this: a socialist, a radical, a demagogue, a dictator, and uh, a lot of the nation's media began became the anti-long at this time. He would attack the never negative uh, press by making his own broadcasts across the nation, and also starting his own um, his own newspaper known as the American Progress. Long became the pull no punches candidate with few friends in Washington. He struck a chord with millions across the nation. And when I say millions, I don't mean like an exaggeration. 7.5 million joined the Share Our Wealth Club and 20 and he had 25 million listeners on the radio as an average, which is a lot in the not early 1900s. Yeah. It's it's a lot now, but imagine like how crazy it is back then where you have such limited access and it takes so much longer to transmit messages. I don't think you could get 25 million people to know who the senator of my state is. Right let alone to get them to listen to him on the radio. That, that's the crazy part. We're not talking about the president. We are talking about Senator. He was more popular than the president at this time. That's insane. Yeah. Um, and he was speaking of this, he received 60,000 letters a week from his supporters. So he was literally, he became, he's kind of like Southern Santa Claus. People ask him for things that he tries to get done. Um, he was also announced that his, he'd be supporting FDR. Um, he said he's the only candidate that shared his philosophy. Um, uh, <clears throat> now, even though he said in 1932 he would, would support FDR, he would later plan to run in 1936 when he found FDR to fail meeting his goals. Yeah. Um He's one of those people that looks at the New Deal and is like, yeah, this is cool enough, but do more. Yeah. Like, he's like, he, he, I imagine just like an image of him busting open the door looking at FDR. What are you doing? What, do you think that I shouldn't be doing this New Deal thing? No, we need nope. to go full force on this bitch. Right, like, what? <laughs> the New Deal is controversial for a lot of people at this time because – there is no doubt that it improved the standard of life in America 100%. But there are so many people that are like, yeah, this is great and all, but like, you need to go farther with this. You need to be pushing more progressive programs. But then all of, this is also the people like, no, this is too much government intervention in our lives. We don't want this stuff. We don't want things like social security or right. whatever. So Hugh Long would have been a stellar candidate. He was popular he has similar to FDR and actually FDR considered him one of the two most dangerous men at this point. The only other man was MacArthur and we're going to do a whole, whole episode on why I hate MacArthur. But yeah, basically there's only two men that FDR feared one Huey P, P. Long and Mac general MacArthur. Those are uh, valid <laughs> choices. Yeah, so now FBI investigations began towards Huey. Uh, and, you know, he would go across the country making speeches. He actually made speeches in Philadelphia, and there's pictures of it, and that's the city close to me. Um, so, yeah, it's pretty cool. However, he would never make it to the election. Around this time, endless assassination attempts began uh, descending on Huey. His personal bodyguard, known as the Skull Crushers, for their brutality against opposition. Yeah, he kind of, 
I'm kind of brushing over this quickly, but let's go on this. He had his own private security force that were pretty brutal and kind of like the Gestapo, you could say. Um, in the fact that they were loyal to Huey and nobody else and kind of filled up the ranks of the police force and they carried guns. Yeah, these these dudes are like um they're like the mafia fit, like enforcers. Yeah, but for Huey Long. Yeah. On September 8th, Huey Long was in Baton Rouge to speak, speak on a special lesson legislation council, pushing through a, a bill that would, uh, many bills, including one that would uh, try to stop gerrymandering from interfering with Louisiana politics. Whoa. Controversial idea. At this time, one Dr. Carl Weiss, the son-in-law of a judge that the Kingfish had put out of a job, entered and shot long in the abdominal. Huey's bodies guards shot Weiss over 60 times as the Kingfish was escorted out of the building. Huey was rushed to a nearby hospital, but surgeons failed to stop the bleeding, ending the life of the King of Louisiana. Huey died two days after he was shot. His final words were, God, don't let me go. I have so much to do. Sad. And uh, just in the respects of the great Huey Long, every man a king. So what do you think of our man Huey? Well, on one hand, Huey is freaking epic. I very much appreciate all of his efforts to um, enhance literacy, uh, make a more efficient transportation system in Louisiana and help uh, the poor people of his state. However, you get into the issue in how he obtained this power and how he got a lot of these plans through, which are very less, they're, they're much less than uh, democratic and go much against our established systems which you know i have i have my own problems with our established systems but uh having somebody like that is uh it's interesting because if he hadn't been such a leader on protecting the working people that a, a man achieving power in such a way is a very dangerous concept yeah, it's on one hand, I <laughs> I long for the idea of a politician like Huey Long, a guy who runs on the idea of not being loyal to any party but the people. Right. And we have tons of politicians who claim, always claim to be that they're for the people. You right. know, you had Bill Clinton, I feel your pain. FDR was, I think, as close as we'll get to a president in a in hundred years who will ever be for the people. Maybe in our lifetime, we'll get another. And Trump claimed to be for the white people, at least. <laughs> Straight up. Um, yeah. I, I should say, like, we were, when we're recording this, it's only been, like, four, five, four, no, three days since there was an attempted coup at the White House. Yeah. But and, uh, boy, I mean, Huey Long is just such a... I, and he's like he, he's a character everybody gets wrong You're right and i call him a character because that's what he is like there's some people in history that i call characters and that's because they are such a strong personality saying their figure doesn't feel right because old breakdown well, there's a lot of internet lefties who demonize uh huey long for kind of being a fascist and there's a lot of republicans who romanticize him for being a fascist but then when you look into his policies, you start questioning things a bit about him, man. Right. So, I mean, at this point, I have to ask you, do you think, I'm going to ask you a few questions about he Huey Long. One, do you think he was justified in abusing power if it meant doing good for people? Um, no. Because that gets into a lot of like Machiavellian principles of the ends justifying the means. And that's a philosophy I don't, I, I typically don't agree with because not, especially when you're talking about uh, governments, 
because like as like as I said earlier, we're lucky that Huey was the man he was because that kind of power in the wrong hands leads to a dangerous situation. Yeah, and I have to. Yeah, sorry, like, keep going. Because uh, especially, especially um, in, especially in America, where we have uh this system of checks and balances, and to have people who scoff at the system of checks and balances, however flawed it may be, uh, can lead uh people down a dangerous path if in in set in some ways uh kind uh trump is an example of why i'm not trying to compare huey long to trump but he's he's kind of like what could have gone wrong with huey if huey was a different person i think huey long's kind of the anti-trump he, he is the anti-trump and the fact that he uses his magnet his magnetism in a way to try to help the better of mankind and end things like racism and divisional uh, class politics. Yes. Um, where the other Trump uses his uh, magnetism. Because as much as I hate Trump, I will say this. There is something about him that makes him very interesting for people to listen to. Yes, 100%. Um, he says it how it is. <laughs> I hate you. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and I agree with you. Like, as much as I love the idea of people taking the power to do the good, better the world, on the other hand, you do justify people to do wrong by the same means, then. Right. Because that just opens the floodgates for someone worse to do the same thing for detrimental purposes. Um, America has a very uh, significant problem with our democratic system and our party system where it takes way too long to get legislation through because of political bickering and votes happening mostly across party lines and as how much i would wish for someone like uh huey long to be in charge where he's just like all right we're just gonna get this done and nobody can really oppose that that's a dangerous prospect because all right who's gonna replace Huey Long? What are the limits of his powers? What if Huey Long tries to do something that's totally out of pocket? What are we right, and now about? here's where I declare I am running on the Share Our Wealth program as the youngest <laughs> senator. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> parody, parody. Um yeah, you know, he really is the example of, yeah, I like you, man, but you're also kind of a danger to society. Correct. And we've all had that friend. Yeah, I'm 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 like I'm I'm a huge fan of a lot of the things that Huey Long did. Yeah, and, and also he changed a lot of Louisiana for the better. Right. He brought them into what was modern at that time. Yeah, like he, there's there there's no doubt he improved Louisiana. He made it that every child had a school book, regardless of race or anything at that time. He was a progressive in every sense of the term. But boy, did he hate socialism. And so let's talk about that. I want, I don't think I addressed it, but socialism not being liked at the time. Keep in mind, the only example of anything close to socialism at the time was the Russian Revolution. Right. Because that, that had occurred very recently. And yeah, in terms of modern history, that did. And because the average man did not know what socialism, they never, nobody... As much as Marx has said, well, if you just read the material, it makes sense. People don't like reading. Stop telling people that. Try to explain it to them. Yeah. It, it, you also just have all this like uh, stigma towards the idea of embracing that kind of ideology. Yeah. The there Russian the Revolution kind of was incredibly bloody and violent on all sides involved. I mean, the socialists, the, you know, the anarchists and the Soviets might be the least bastardy in that one. I will say that. Because you literally had the Cossacks, the Cossacks on behalf of the White Party, raping and pillaging their way across Russia, and the Tsar's party was, um, how do you put this, awful. Yeah, everything about the Tsars is awful. <laughs> yeah, Russia is just a history of. Hey, could the this get worse? Yes. <laughs> yep. Um. So my final question for you: If Huey Long had run for president, do you think he would have been president? And how do you think that would have changed America? I I know that's a big one. I, I think I think he might have actually. Um, I mean, it, it all it actually depends on his response to World War II, which hadn't broken out yet. Yeah. At the time, at the time of his death, 
we were still in the midst of the, of the depression and FDR um, was well on his way into his presidency. So we don't know how he would, he, if there's an, he would have had to challenge FDR in the primaries. I don't think he would have beat FDR. That, there was no I, way that was going to happen. I, but I think definitely after World War II, definitely after FDR was done, he could have been a potential big dog if he had lived that long. Right. It's just the thing, World War II complicates things so much because we know FDR won four terms. Yeah. Um, Which is the only time that's happened in history. It's the only time it's ever happened, and it's the only time it's ever going to happen because now we have the 23rd Amendment. Yeah. But um, Which, thank they, God we have that crap. Yeah. <laughs> I, I I love the twenty third amendment, but I don't know. Could he have challenged? Like I don't think he could have challenged after a second term. But could he have challenged his third term? Probably not, because everyone is like, at the, at that time, you're just thinking about like I'd rather have like a consistent leader through this crisis, right? But I think when the war is over, when the war is over, I think he has a good chance. Because yeah, um, obviously, then you get like Truman after FDR passes away. Yeah. Truman. And, you know, Tr- Tr- Truman's his own figure. It's not he's not entirely popular. Yep. Um I think I think a populist like Huey would have definitely had a really good shot post World War II. So now we're gonna do our uh, question from the fans, except we nobody sent in a question this week. And reminder, if you do want to send us a question, send that to chaos effect history at gmail.com. Now, Tyler, we yeah. spent this entire episode probably talking about one of my problematic favorites from history. Who's your uh, pro- problematic favorite car- uh, favorite person from history? You know, we talked about him a lot this episode, and I, I, I <laughs> FDR is really, yeah, because <laughs> uh, as much as I want to praise the, the New Deal and his leadership through World War II, I cannot. I will not let the internment camp slide. Yeah, the con- they were concentration camps. Like, let's be real. I I will not let that slide. As and um, as much as I really, yeah, I was like, the New Deal was revolutionary, and I it not all of those programs were successful, and not all of them went far enough. And I I very much agree that like. FDR should have gone a little bit harder on the New Deal. But I very much admire the willingness to try something new, to go forward with a plan. We don't really know if it's going to work out or not, but with the promise that, or the intention that this will genuinely help people and improve their lives. And not a lot of politicians will have that kind of ambition because they're so concerned about playing it safe. Yeah. Also, just the pure conviction of like somebody like both Huey Long and FDR or something to admire. Um, I'd say like I have a lot of problematic favorite. Fig- Shea oh, yeah. is on there for sure. Yeah. Because like on one hand, you understand why he did these things. He still did kind of kill some innocent people and did some bad stuff. Um, for me, definitely a, a, a big one on that list is probably Teddy Roosevelt. Oh, Teddy Roosevelt, absolutely. Something with the Ro- Roosevelts. But uh, yeah. people forget that uh, Teddy Teddy Roosevelt was a racist imperialist. Yep. And that is something that you got to understand. Because they don't really yeah. tell you about that part. Uh, and that's they the tell thing you about I'm... his trust busting and... Uh, the fact that he read the jungle a couple times, <laughs> but we don't really know how not his role. Also, in, do uh, you want to explain what the jungle is real quick? Good old, it's a, it's, it's a novel or no, it's not. A, I don't know if it's considered a novel. It's a book by Upton Sinclair that really uh, tears apart Gilded Aid in, industry and goes in, into a lot of depth about, food manufacturing yeah and exposes a lot of the problems with corporations and the food production in america mm-hmm. and it's nasty and 
Ch- Teddy Roosevelt is famous for reading that book and he's and then just like going like no we're not doing that no more but yeah I think the most like Teddy Roosevelt's definitely like I oh, so cool he did all this stuff it's like really bad racist yeah, yeah. T- Teddy Roosevelt is also he is like a really cool guy like you he's, he's like the, he has this uh personality of like this outdoorsman he loves our national he he basically uh revolutionized our national park system he loves nature i'm and- sure you've had this moment because like we both go to a college with a lot of people you ever meet a dude like talking class it's like oh dude this guy's really pretty chill we're talking about a lot of the same things he likes and then it's like five minutes in like some political discussion he says something like oh 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 <laughs> you have terrible views <laughs> yeah all right so um in my history class this semester um we were talking about um this was right after uh supreme court um justice amy coney barrett was nominated uh and we were talking about the supreme court in our u.s history class and one person is asking questions about it, it was like okay that's cool he's you know asking questions or whatever but then in mid conversation he turns his flat he turns his camera on and he's got this giant <laughs> trump flag on the wall <laughs> with like you those this semester too <laughs> but like I had my camera on at this time because I'm like, you know, there's like nobody, there's like 60 people in this class, but nobody has their cameras on. So I'm like, yeah, I, I wasn't doing anything. So I might as well just like make it feel like he's like talking to somebody. Yeah. But like he turned his camera on and I'm just like, oh, <laughs> all right. Well, that's all the time we have for this episode. Thanks to you for the listens and you can find us wherever podcasts are and uh, soon we'll be on the social medias. Yes. Um, real quick. Uh, I f- I figured out which YouTuber it was, and I just want to give him a shout out. Emperor Tiger Star did a very good video. On yes, a- love his content. Always yes. awesome. That's that's the that's the one that really inspired my Huey Long uh, research. So I just want I I remembered the name, and I just wanted to give a shout out. All right, see y'all.